Hello, everyone. If you are curious about how you can support the podcast, you can head over to lifeofxpodcast.com and click through to our support page, and you can find all of the ways that you could ever dream of helping Life of X right there. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Eric Tadala. And this is Arnold Schwarzenegger. And that makes this the Life of X. As noted, I am joined today by Arnold Schwarzenegger, also known as Marcus Schuf. Marcus, thank you for returning to Life of X to help tell the tale of Sam the Banana Man, Zamuri. My third week here, I'm happy to be here. If you can't detect Marcus's sarcasm, we have just been locked in this room together all day recording these three episodes to bring them to your ears. Anyway, we last left off in our tale of Sam Zamuri. He'd completed his takeover. The fish had eaten the whale, united fruit. He had become the president. He had issued all sorts of reforms that had improved the state of the company. And where we last left off, it was going through World War II, which was really hard on Sam, basically in every possible way. You know, it was difficult for Sam from a business perspective because of the just the pressures that it put on the company. It was tragic in that he lost his son. And then sort of, you know, from an identity perspective, once the war was over and and the world had been able to see the tragedy that was the Holocaust, it really affected Sam too, according to author of his biography, Rich Cohen. And that is kind of where we're going to pick up. Marcus, do you want to interject anything before we dive right in? Got Let's get right to it. All right, let's go. So, you know, we talked about the fact that earlier in, I believe it was episode two, maybe it was episode one, that Sam had never been a particularly religious person or connected to his Jewish identity and past. Sam had, you know, not married a Jewish woman. He had not raised his children to be Jewish people, religiously, I should say. And to my knowledge, if I remember correctly, neither of them married Jewish people either. But the whole idea of the Holocaust really, really affected Sam. I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that, you know, many of the victims of the Holocaust were Eastern European Jews, just like Sam. Had things been different, had Sam not come to the United States, like it could have been Sam in those camps. But in the early 1920s, he had been contacted by a guy named Heim Wiseman, who some of you may recognize that name. For those of you who don't, I'll just give you a quick description of who he was. He was a Zionist leader and Israeli statesman who served as president of the Zionist organization and later as the first president of Israel. He was elected on February 16th, 1949, and served until his death in 1942. And it was also Wiseman who would go on, and we'll touch on this, to convince the United States government to recognize the newly formed state of Israel. And, and for those of you who don't know what Zionism is, Zionism is this idea that Jewish people, as an ethnicity, as a religious group, needed their own homeland. And so that is what Chaim was doing in trying to drum up support for this Zionist movement. And of course, the Zionist movement received enormous, enormous support through the tragic experience of the Holocaust. Right. Harkening back to this tragedy that was the death of Sam Jr., Sam needed something he was the kind of person who could, you know, he, he needed to work through his grief, basically. And so he needed a cause to get behind. And he dedicated himself to the Zionist cause. Like I said, a lot of it had to do with the fact that Sam very well could have been one of these people, one of these victims of the Holocaust, had circumstances not been different, had he not come to the United States when he did. And, you know, it was a really scary moment for European Jews during this time. The British White Paper was still in effect. And in a nutshell, what the White Paper was was a policy paper that basically limited immigration into the British mandate of Palestine. And I believe the number was 70, something around 75,000 for five years. And this was a time where these victims of the Holocaust had nowhere to go. In many cases, they would try to return home and they were turned back because, you know, what had been their land was no longer their land. Right. And it's really important to understand that Great Britain and France at the time were occupying much of the Middle East. And so Great Britain had this fear that if more and more Jews were let into the Middle East, it was not going to be able to hold on to the territory because Muslim Arabs would revolt and revolt and revolt. But at the same time, what kind of humanitarian obligation do you have? And of course, uh, towards Jews to give them a safe haven once and for all. And also, of course, there were lobbying issues by pro-Jewish groups in Great Britain and the United States to change the status quo. With that being said, Sam, as the United Fruit president, couldn't openly break the British blockade 
to smuggle people into Palestine. But he had a lot of resources behind him. He was very wealthy. He was very powerful. And so basically he indirectly helped to smuggle people in and help them settle there. In 1948, Sam actually resigned at the age of 71 years old. His presidency from United Fruit, he wanted again to really focus all of his time and energy into helping this Zionist cause. It was not a coincidence that he did it at this time because the partition plan was up for debate and because the partition plan was up for debate in the United Nations and Sam needed it to pass. And, you know, again, for those of you who don't know what the partition plan was, there's a lot that goes into this whole story, basically. The Arab-Israeli conflict, go read about that. There's actually an excellent podcast series called Fear and Loathing in New Jerusalem by a podcaster who goes by the name Martyr Maid. It is a fantastic series. It goes into this whole issue from basically beginning to end. So we're not doing it nearly enough justice here. But basically, the partition plan was just trying to find a way to separate Palestinians and Jews into their own like sectors of what is today Israel. And it was really not a great plan at all. But basically, this was going through the United Nations at the time, and Sam wanted it to pass. And so what he did was he used his influence to lean on Latin American leaders and members of the United Nations to sway their votes in favor of the resolution. And it absolutely worked. Cohen, I forget exactly where but or, and what the numbers were, but Cohen basically goes through and shows the difference that Sam had on these Latin American countries. And, and he really did sway a good many of them to do it. Yeah. And on, on top of that, behind the scenes, and that's something about Zamiri all the time, he never wants to be a public face. He always wants to be behind the scenes. And behind the scenes, he also actually pressured several other businessmen to use their ships to help many Jews to take their ships from Europe into Israel, thereby putting more pressure on the British government. Yeah, very, very long story short. Basically, Israel's existence is secured. Sam feels comfortable with the fact that they're, you know, standing on their own two feet or for the most part, and he returns to United Fruit as the president. And, you know, by this time in his life, he is already showing signs of Parkinson's disease, which, for those of you who don't know, is a long-term degenerative disorder of the central nervous system that mainly affects the motor system and generally takes quite a while to really set in. And, you know, unsurprisingly, World War II had very far-reaching implications across the globe, and that was no different on the isthmus. The Latin Americans had heard FDR and basically the entire alliance talking about these ideas of self-determination and all that. And so they were kind of thinking of themselves like, hey, we'd like some self-determination. And so you, you start to see these ideas bubble up on the isthmus and also ideas like communism bubble up on the isthmus. And that kind of leads us to the, the lead up and then the actual execution of Marcus's very favorite topic, Operation Success. Yep. So I, I, I do find Operation Success or Operation PB Success, as it's also known, very, very fascinating topic of U.S.-Latin American relations. And we really have to start out with this idea that Erf just mentioned. FDR had very lofty rhetoric. And Latin Americans, especially prior to FDR, had felt very much oppressed, like they did, couldn't decide their own political fate. After World War II, when virtually all of Latin America, actually all of Latin America, Argentina being the last one to come down on the Allied side, but all of Latin America had helped the United States to win the war, also, of course, helped the Soviet Union to win the war indirectly through their goods, partly also through their war efforts. Well, now it was time to milk the cash cow, or whatever the expression is, something along those lines, right? To, to come ho and ho uh, home and roost the chicken, <laughs> to, conflate, <laughs> to, to, con to conflate more expressions. Uh, uh, I hope I can be forgiven for that. But at the same time, because very soon it became obvious that the former allies of the Soviet Union, the United States and Great Britain were breaking apart, especially in its origins over Europe, but also Asia, that there was a very strong ideological gap between communism and capitalism and division of the Soviet Union and the United States represented. And before too long, the United States overreacted to threats all across the globe and with very real consequences for Latin Americans. One of the first countries to directly experience this paradigmatic shift in U.S. policy towards Latin America was Guatemala, in the early 1950s, both from the perspective of communism, but also from the perspective of business interests that the United Fruit Company had in Guatemala. Guatemala's move to the left 
seemed to pose an ostensible threat to U.S. imperatives in the region. U.S. investments in Guatemala were enormous, and especially, of course, through the United Fruit Company. The United Fruit Company alone, at that point, already had a larger GNP, gross national product, or also known as GDP later on, than any other Central American country. It had, it had enormous privileges due to its very good relations to dictators, and also very strongly undervalued tax claims. In Guatemala alone, the United Fruit Company owned 75% of all banana plantations in Guatemala, and bananas had an enormous importance to the Guatemalan economy, bananas making up 50% of the entire economy. The United Fruit Company held 70% of all arable land, but, for reasons we have discussed before, diseases, etc., actually left 85% of it unused. Yeah, so remember, we talked about Panama disease, and so... They had continued this practice of just buying up so much land. Just to, again, I put that in perspective in the United States. Imagine if, think about all the farmland in the United States, and now imagine that one company or, you know, a country or whatever, some entity that was not the United States or wasn't these private farmers owned 70% of all of the land and then didn't even touch 85% of that. Right. And uh, of course, we can put some of the onus or we can blame the. Panama disease to some degree, but also, of course, it was greed. Land was cheap for one of the wealthiest companies in the world. If I don't buy it, my competitor will. We are going to hold on to that land because we can. If we think about the political context of Guatemala in, in particular, this left move, it also didn't come out of nowhere. It especially came from this very long history of dictators of Guatemala having exceptional relationships with the United Fruit Company, giving them the tax privileges we've talked about, kickbacks, benefiting from the United Fruit Company and the United Fruit Company not really giving back to the workers, and that bred enormous frustration among Guatemalans. And so one of the people who epitomized this very cozy relationship between the U.S. company and the United Fruit Company, one of those leaders was Jorge Ubico, who was brutal and hated in Guatemala, especially because he had such good relations to the United Fruit Company, which again was basically benefiting at the back of the Guatemalan laborers. But like many dictators and strongmen on the political right, Ubico was popular with the church and with landowners, something that will come up later again. And that's an alliance really between church, landowners, and right-wing dictators that lasted in Latin America through the 1960s. Working under Ubico, and the United Fruit Company was very difficult, Guatemala perhaps being the most extreme case. In some areas, landowners, imagine that, landowners had the legal right to kill you if the peasants did not work 100 days a year for them. So just to clarify, you're saying that if you owned land in Guatemala, you had the legal right to murder someone who refused to work for you? Exactly. Man, that is unbelievable. That is slavery, and perhaps yeah. you can imagine why people were looking to alternatives to Ubico. Yeah. Well, the alternatives that came about was, first of all, Juan José Arevalo, who really, when he came to power after Ubico was ejected. So in 1944, Ubico basically cracks down very violently on some uprising, and before too long, he realizes he had to leave. And so instead of him, someone to his left came to power, and his name was Juan José Arevalo, whose beginning of his presidency in 1945 is considered as the beginning of 10 years of springtime, in which he advocated education reforms and also, at least rhetorically, gave his support to land reforms. You say rhetorically, did he actually enact land reform? So he actually did not enact land reform, but at least he made it a national conversation and created a very important precedent for his successor, Jacobo Arbenz, about whom we'll talk quite a bit. But in, in any case, he was much more popular than Ubico had been and actually stood for the people. Then in 1951, Arevalo's successor, who was also his secretary of defense, Jacobo Arbenz, came to power, and he was a socialist who included a few communists in his regime, so he was even further left than uh, Arevalo was. He was very popular when he came to power. The, the people loved his political agenda, and he was inspired by FDR. He wanted Social Security. He wanted to limit working hours. You know, my impression of him from reading Cohen's book was that he was basically looking to enact a new deal in Guatemala. And he even legalized the Communist Party. It had been illegal to even exist prior to. Um, important to our story, he enacted Decree 900, which granted the government the right to expropriate uncultivated portions of land in Guatemala, which was very 
obviously directed primarily at United Fruit, who, as we mentioned, only cultivated about 15% of the hundreds of thousands of acres of land that it owned in Guatemala. So tons of that land, like again, hundreds and thousands of acres of land were confiscated from United Fruit and distributed among the people of Guatemala. Now, Marcus, you made a comment earlier that I wanted to ask you about. Was this like an even distribution among the Guatemalans or was there, you know, like how for the people was our Benz really? So the idea was to distribute it equally to everyone. But in reality, once he actually passed the degree, the reality was that it benefited wider Guatemalans, less indigenous Guatemalans more than the actual indigenous Guatemalan. And that's a criticism that the left has, uh, even those who believed in Arvins and some as definitely lesser evil to Ubico or even to the United Fruit Company, that is a criticism the left has leveled against him. And that goes back, listener, to the conversation that we had briefly, at, I believe the beginning of episode one about the whole ethnic breakdown in um, Latin America. And so really this idea of land reform, whether it be in the Flotsons that Arvins undertook or not, that's a really... If you know nothing about Latin America, what is important to know is that land reform is at the core of the 20th century when we talk about economic, social, racial issues. Whether we talk about the Mexican Revolution in the 19-teens, or Castro's Revolution in 1959, or any other revolution that comes up, the very strong discrepancy of land-owning patterns, that the very top elites owned almost everything, whether it be foreign or domestic, and that the masses of Latin Americans owned nothing or had to work in slave-like conditions. That is at the core of the 20th century, and was really, really important to Guatemalans. And the Decree 900 was one of the most obvious steps taken to break with that pattern. And I think it can be hard for people who live in places like the United States to really conceptualize that, because, you know, in the U.S., even though, yes, large swaths of land are owned by people, companies, whatever, there's still land to be bought. It is hard to think about the tiny sliver of land that must have been available for someone to try to own in Guatemala after these enormous companies and other private landholders held it. Right, and that's not even to speak of the much higher population density that's seen in Guatemala than the United States, let alone the fact that, as we just addressed, that 70% of all arable land was already gone, but not even in Guatemalan hands, but in the hands of Zamiri and his American partners. Yeah, so it would be truly difficult for someone to try to climb the socioeconomic ladder in countries like Guatemala at this time. That's right. And the way that Arbenz went about taking away the land from United Fruit Company and other very large companies that were owning it is actually really interesting. It's a, it's a smart way to approach it. So rather than just confiscating the land, what Arbenz said was, I'm going to reimburse you for the land. I'm going to compensate you for the land that I'm taking from you. But what measure did he take? Well, Arbenz, of course, was aware that the United Fruit Company, like pretty much any company, especially United Fruit Company in Central America, had been cheating on its taxes due to its very good relationships with other dictators like Ubico. And so in the year before, the United Fruit Company had stated that its land was worth $600,000, which, of course, it was worth more, much, much more than $600,000. So he said, well, you stated it's worth $600,000, so that's what you're going to get. This, understandably from the United Fruit Company's and Sumeria's perspective, upset them because they actually thought that their land was worth much more than that, and they demanded $15 million and went to the State Department to complain and somehow put pressure on the Guatemalan government through the U.S. government to revert its steps. It's also interesting, too, another reaction that Sam and United Fruit had to Decree 900, was to basically attack Arbenz in another way. Sam immediately, and this kind of, you know, it's going to tie in a lot with what Marcus just said, but he goes and hires every high-level DC person he can find to lobby on his behalf. And he also pulls back in his man that we talked about before, Edward Bernays, who, if you don't remember, was basically the father of modern public relations. Sam hired him originally to help sell bananas in 1944, but now wanted to help him basically paint Arbenz as this evil communist and basically to convince the American people and more specifically people in D.C., policymakers, people who can make things happen, that Arbenz was bad for the United States, was bad for capitalism, and basically to convince them that the United States' interests were aligned with United Fruits. And to a large extent, he succeeds. 
Cohen, for his part, notes that during the early 1950s, it was hard to distinguish the United Fruit Company from the CIA. They shared personnel, they shared equipment, they shared intelligence. Several CIA administrators had worked for the United Fruit Company in the past. The CIA modeled some of their coups on Sam's initial coup in Honduras. This was kind of mind-blowing to me, and it really speaks to the, the muddling of business and government at this time, but United Fruit, even a few times, funded the CIA when the government money fell short. And it's really important to note here, really, how the Eisenhower administration is key to this entire Guatemalan debacle. Because the Truman administration, which, don't get me wrong, by no means was dovish or anything like that. They put their foot down when they wanted to oppose communism worldwide. But really, Eisenhower was much more open to red-baiting propaganda. Under him, the CIA had much more leeway. And that already was clear through, for instance, that the Somoza dynasty up in Nicaragua, which was a very close ally of the United States, had proposed to Truman prior to that to overthrow the left-wing government of Guatemala, Guatemala and Nicaragua not getting along very much. Truman had said no. Now, when that idea was broached again, Eisenhower was more open to the idea of overthrowing Arbenz in the first place. One of the reasons why Eisenhower was more open to the idea of overthrowing Arbenz and left-wing regimes in general was that there was a serious series of conflicts of interest. For one most famously, perhaps, we had John Foster Dulles, who was the Secretary of State and who had been a former legal partner in one of the law firms of the United Fruit Company. So imagine you have the Secretary of State, one of the most prestigious positions you can have, and then at the same time, he had previously worked with the United Fruit Company. The same applies to his brother, Alan Dulles, who was actually the head of the CIA, who was a former board member of the United Fruit Company. Then there was Ed Whitman who was married to Eisenhower's personal secretary, who was at the same time in charge of the United Fruit Company's PR. John Morse Cabot, who was the Secretary of Latin American Affairs, so also very high in the State Department, and his brother had previously been a chief executive of the United Fruit Company. Then there was Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., the UN ambassador, who had a pro-United Fruit Company position and blocked Soviet attempts to send UN observers to Guatemala during the Arbenz crisis. Also, what is really interesting is how the CIA looked at what Zamuri had done in Honduras in 1911. And it's also interesting, too, I just want to note, listeners may remember that from our series on Eisenhower, how much more open he was to wielding the CIA as a tool for foreign policy. He really looked at the CIA as his direct arm to the world, kind of. And, you know, <laughs> history has shown us that he was very happy to swing that sword or swing that fist, however you want to think about it. Yeah, and really, as Eisenhower came into office, he was willing to go away from just containment, to move away from containment, so containing communist influence where it was, to go all the way into rollback, to use force, to undo any leftist stream. Now, importantly, Arbenz, of course, wasn't a communist, but partly because of Zamuri and other propaganda and PR efforts, that's exactly how he was depicted. And so one question that historians grapple with is, how much was it really United Fruit Company? behind this and the conflicts of interest we just addressed, and how much was it just the fear of communism per se? Yeah, and you know, another debate kind of goes on is just how much this whole idea of communism even affected some of the decisions he made, because history has shown that in a lot of cases, as you just mentioned with Arbenz, that a lot of the people who were overthrown weren't communists. You know what I mean? Or in a lot of cases, they didn't even have communist leanings. They were just you know, uncomfortable for the United States to have in power. I keep thinking back to Operation Ajax, which overthrew mm -hmm. uh, Mohammed Mossadegh in Iran in 1953. He was definitely a leftist, but he wasn't a communist. And there's probably going to be a series by the life of X to talk about him at some point. And that's an interesting situation, but it's just uh, very reminiscent of this whole situation as well. Right. And as we discuss actually how the CIA was able to overthrow Arbenz, they learned a lot from the operation in Iran, yeah. uh, how to do that. And of course, it also set this weird precedence. Both cases set this weird precedent where the United States thought that it could roll like that for the rest of time and repeat the same pattern, which, of course, in most cases, including Cuba, did not work. Now, how did they exactly go about overthrowing Arbenz? Well, very simply, the CIA chose a former general who had been in Guatemala, who was far on the right, named Castillo Armas, who, because he had tried to overthrow the left-wing government uh, prior was living in exile in 
Out of all places, Honduras, of course, about which we talked quite a bit. Interestingly as well, the CIA recruited 400 soldiers in the United States and trained them in Honduras. So Honduras, through most of the Cold War, was actually the closest ally in Central America of the United States. But Armas did not find approbation everywhere. So one example is again the Somoza dynasty, Anastasio Somoza, to, uh, about whom we had talked earlier, up in Nicaragua. He was very unhappy with Armas, called him a little prick. And in part, of course, he didn't like Armas because Somoza himself wanted to be active in overthrowing Arbenz, but the Eisenhower administration refused that step, warning that it would not look legitimate enough and like the United States was behind the effort of removing Arbenz. And one thing that I thought was very interesting in the whole Armas situation, but even before with General Bonilla, at least it was talked about a lot in Cohen's book, that this idea that they were very specific in picking someone who looked indigenous to kind of be the faces of these revolutions because they wanted, I mean, I can't imagine that people didn't realize who was actually behind these overthrows, but they wanted there to be at least be an indigenous looking face to their revolts. Exactly. Try to hide your hand as much as you could. And the very important CIA agent, Howard Hunt, said exactly that when he saw Armas the first time, he has this Indian face. <laughs> wow. Beyond secretly training soldiers in Honduras, the United States also took direct action as a government, so with a much less hidden hand. For one, it blocked the Guatemalan harbor so that Guatemala would not be uh, able to bring anything in, which, strictly speaking, is actually a, a blockade is an act of war. That's one thing to think about. But the U.S.-Guatemalan War. Yeah, basically, the famous U.S.-Guatemalan War. <laughs> Arabans tried to use diplomacy to go to the Organization of American States, basically an organization of the Western Hemisphere together, founded by the United States, trying to protest that action, but at the time it was still mostly a tool of the United States. And so there was no way that his neighbors were going to help him out as his government was under duress. There was also U.S. weapon embargo so that Arbenz wouldn't be able to fight back against this invasion by Armas. Well, as a consequence, and Arbenz directly said so, because he couldn't get any weapons from the United States or his closer allies, he reached out to whom? Well, the enemies of the United States. The commies. The commies. Dangerous. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> Horrible. Please take that out. No. <laughs> and uh, in that case, Czechoslovakia. Now, Czechoslovakia sent over weapons. But to the very bad fortune of Arbenz, the CIA knew about this deal that weapons were going to be sent from Czechoslovakia through Sweden all the way to the Western Hemisphere to Guatemala and tracked the ship and never lost sight of it. And so in the end, actually intercepted those weapons, which, by the way, would have been useless anyway, because they were old. Most of them didn't work. They were still from World War II. And it was a major embarrassment to the Arbenz administration. and. Probably the worst part, it made him look like an actual red sympathizer in the very biased eyes of Washington. In reaction, when it came out that those weapons had been intercepted and that Arbus had tried to get hold of those weapons, again, remember, in reaction to the U.S. embargo of any weapons, Eisenhower, in a famous speech to Congress in April 1954, remarked, the Reds are in control in Guatemala, and they are trying to spread their influence to San Salvador as a first step to breaking out of Guatemala to other South American countries. And that really, that idea is the equivalent of the domino theory in Vietnam. Eisenhower obviously famously was concerned that if Vietnam fell as a country, then all of Southeast Asia would be communist, then it would spread down to Indonesia, and in the end, all the way to Australia. And that's the same idea here. Oh, look how red Guatemala has gotten. Now, before too long, all of Latin America is going to be communist. On to more propaganda. So Erv just talked about Bernays and how he was really important because Zemiri had commissioned him. And, you know, just to interject real quick, it is really, really, really hard to get across how important and interesting of a figure Edward Bernays was during this period in time. I can't, off the top of my head, I know that uh, the podcast Stuff You Should Know has done a really interesting episode on him, uh, not particularly in depth, but very interesting nonetheless. So I strongly suggest that you check them out. Uh, like I said, Melvin and I will probably cover them at some point, but really go out and re at least read his Wikipedia page. He's a very interesting and influential person. Sorry, Marcus. Go yeah, ahead. no, that, that, that's a, a great point. And actually, I myself would be interested in that. Well, one part that is also interesting about Bernays is that he made very much romanticized movies about the United Fruit Company that were then sold to American audience. One of them called 
uh, Journey to Banana Land sounds beautiful. <laughs> kind of ridiculous. Also, yeah, if that wasn't ridiculous enough, he really read his times. And so the other movie that he made, also on behalf of the United Fruit Company and really at the behest of Zemiri, was Why the Kremlin Hates Bananas. <laughs> Which, I guess, if you think about the shortages and that people couldn't get bananas in Eastern Europe, is true, but wasn't the intention of communist socialist leaders. But uh, less entertainingly so, Bernays and others also became associated with fake photos that showed Guatemalan military soldiers torturing and killing innocent civilians. And those pictures were sold to American journalists who did not interrogate those pictures whatsoever. They didn't do their own reports and really uh, tarnished the image of Arvins, whereas Arvins basically was very cautious, and some people argue too cautious actually in using force to resist the onslaught by Armas. Also interesting, beyond uh, Bernays were other people who had their own PR firm. So one other uh, example would be uh, John Clements. He had previously worked for the Hearst Corporation, a corporation that was famous for its scandalous news articles. Some historians argue that Hearst was so powerful through his articles in the late 1800s that he actually partly helped cause the Spanish-American War. That's for a different chapter of this podcast. But so just to show it was really a corporation that was to some degree tainted, and Clements worked for them. Well, what did uh, Clements do? Well, Zemeri told Clements to write fake reports that Arvins and the Soviet Union were trying to take over the Panama Canal, thereby yet again reinforcing this already skewed perception by Washington, D.C. that Arvins was a diehard communist and that his only goal was to undermine the United States and its objectives in the world rather than to stand up for social and economic justice. That report that supposedly the Soviet Union and Arvins were going to take over the Panama Canal was actually received by hundreds of legislators and legislative aides. Clements also had close relations with Walter Bedell Smith, who was Eisenhower's chief of staff during World War II and a former CIA director. Walter Bedell Smith, also known as Beetle Smith, became undersecretary of state under Eisenhower, thereby pointing to yet another connection between the Eisenhower administration and the CIA and uh, Guatemala, because Smith had also wanted to become the new United Fruit Company president. That never materialized, but nonetheless, those relationships clearly show this conflict of interest yet again in the Eisenhower administration. It really is crazy how much United Fruit was tied up with the United States government. The octopus's tentacles are long. Right, we always talk about that a country within a country. Well, this is really a government within the government or whatever you want to call it. Usually, and that's definitely a pun intended, you think along those lines of the conflict of interest in banana republics. But no, this is the very United States, the most powerful country in the world with the GDP of 50% of the world after World War II. And here is a company with extraordinary influence. And kind of just to continue to talk about some of this propaganda that was employed by the U.S. I and mean, the CIA during this time, it's kind of funny if it weren't so like sad. Some of the stuff that went on, um, just a couple of examples here. You have out of Miami, there was a propaganda radio station that I believe translates to like Voice of the Revolution or something like that. Well, they hired an American actor to basically bring voice to this fake account that Arbenz had committed suicide. So this was like, pre-Twitter Twitter bots going off and, and just spouting <laughs> <laughs> spouting fake news. You know, Hunt, who we had talked about, he was a CIA agent who liked Armas's quote-unquote Indian face. He contacted a New York City cardinal to reach out to Guatemalan Catholic leaders. These Catholic leaders reached out to congregations by letter, basically writing about how terrible Arbenz was. Kind of along these same lines, CIA planes even went to drop thousands of these letters about how bad Arbenz was to the rural portions of Guatemala, where radio signals couldn't reach because the radios were primarily reaching the urban centers. And in these urban centers, they would blast battle noise through the loudspeakers in these cities to make it sound like there was actual conflict going on. And they would even go so far as to drop smoke bombs in the city to like really play up the fact that like there's a there's a battle going on that wasn't happening. In one instance, though, the CIA really did begin to bombard military installments in poor parts of Guatemala City. Yeah, and that led to a few deaths. And really, this whole propaganda, why we spend so much time on the propaganda, is to emphasize how important it was. Because Armas himself was relatively incompetent as a general. Armas himself never would have brought down the Arbenz government. He never would have prevailed. The entire atmosphere created by the CIA, that Guatemala was in chaos, that, he, that Arbenz was hated, that battle was breaking out over and over again, perhaps even ideas that uh, Arbenz had uh, killed himself, 
That led to the impression that Arbenz was much weaker than he actually was in military strength. Even Arbenz himself sometimes was <laughs> perhaps not convinced that he had committed suicide, <laughs> but he definitely uh, wasn't quite as clear that he held on to more power than he did. And in that is really why we cannot overstate the importance of the CIA in bringing down Arbenz and why Arbenz in the end stepped down. Now, Arbenz did have one last-ditch attempt to hold on to power, and that was his idea to arm civilians with weapons to fight back against Armas. But the military refused, and so once again, Arbenz's attempt to change his fate backfired. So, we remember how he tried to get weapons from Czechoslovakia, that put the United States even more on alert. Now, in this case, he appealed to his military to uh, arm civilians, and that backfired because now the military Appalled, decided to defect altogether, and Arbenz, drinking for several days in a row, decided to step down. And actually, there are famous pictures where he is in uh, Guatemala City at the airport, dressed down only to his pants. He even had to take off his shirt that made waves throughout the world. So really humiliated at the airport, he would keep, over the next decades, he would be all over the world, especially in Europe, would in the end live in Mexico for most of, uh, of his life where he drank himself to death, drugged himself to death, and actually drowned in a bathtub. So a, a sad ending to a leader who once was very popular, but who failed to, to accomplish, of course, what he wanted, because the CIA was so very effective in its methods. Ultimately, so the CIA, United Fruit Company, succeed. But what also happened was that they brought a lot of attention to themselves. And Marcus has already said that Sam really liked to fly under the radar. And like to kind of operate in the shadows, but this was widely covered by the global media and in the U.S., and so they draw on quite a bit of attention to it, and, you know, questions started to come up. Like, who really was Arbenz? Was he even a communist? Was his ouster good for America or just for United Fruit? Was this about the Cold War, really, or was this about the United Fruit Company? Yeah, no, and that's a really great point. So I think we can all argue, and that's definitely what Cohen does, that in the end, this was blowback. So blowback is something that we call, in the short term, it seems to to work for you, Iran would be another great example. It worked in 1953 to overthrow Mossadegh, which, of course, is one of the reasons why we had the 1979 Iranian revolutions, because Mossadegh was very popular, and the Shah that the United States put in place instead of Mossadegh was very much hated by most Iranians. And that's the same thing here. Arabins, whereas perhaps not the most competent leader in world history, was very popular in his own country. What came after him, including Armas, was very much hated. And now we have a company that very soon was suspected to be behind the overthrow, and the CIA was suspected to be behind the overthrow, that really damaged the United Fruit Company's image. Beyond that, and that's even more important for world history, was that out of all people to be present during the overthrow of Arbenz was no one else than... Che Guevara. So Che was present during the coup against Arbenz. He himself was from Argentina originally. He was a doctor, kind of from a privileged family. He had traveled all across Latin America. A great movie you have to watch is The Motorcycle Diaries. Uh, really, really great about his travels. Of course, romanticizes him a little bit too, but that's fine. And had made his way to Guatemala at that point. That is prior to meeting Fidel Castro, whom he would meet in Mexico later. And of course, Fidel Castro and Che Guevara were the main protagonists in overthrowing the corrupt Batista government in Cuba that went to, uh, had its downfall in 1959. That's for our new podcast. I don't want to <laughs> over-elaborate here. But at the time, while the coup was underway, or while Amos was invading from Honduras, Che Guevara had offered his services to Arbenz. He had said, I will fight for you, I'll defend you, I'll defend democracy. Let's never forget that Arbenz was democratically elected, right? Arbenz had said, no, thank you, I don't want any irregular troops. I want just my military to fight for me, because if irregular troops start to defend me, then people are going to notice how much more dire the situation actually is than it should be. So that's the first part. But the more important part was that Che Guevara, because he was there and he, because he observed what the CIA was doing, what United Fruit was doing, he really grew resentful and vowed to make use of armed struggle in the future to fight back against capitalism's, what he perceived to be exploitation of Latin America. And there you have it. Che Guevara, more than just the t-shirt you bought in college. <laughs> and let's think about this. So if we take this leap of thought, this very easy chain of reaction, that perhaps without United Fruit overthrowing Arbenz, Che Guevara wouldn't have been as radicalized to meet Fidel Castro, who knows if the Cuban Revolution would have happened? 
Who knows if the Bay of Pigs would have happened? Who knows if even the Cuban Missile Crisis would have happened? It almost put everyone into total disarray that could have uh, annihilated much of the world. Really, really important. The tentacles of the United Fruit Company, for better or worse, for worse, <laughs> cannot be underestimated. Yeah, it's a great point. So to come back to the idea of blowback one more time in the context of Arbenz's overthrow, in the short term, absolutely, it paid off to United Fruit Company. It got most of its land back, or all of its land back, virtually overnight. It had a congenial dictator in Armas, who was now in power because it replaced Arbenz. But in the long run, it was not effective whatsoever because its reputation lay in shatters and would never recover from the bad reputation that it suffered because of 1954 Guatemala. Yeah. And kind of returning to the point that we had talked about this backlash from the public that now the CIA and, and the United Fruit Company was receiving, Eisenhower had to act, basically. In response to all of this uh, pressure, he was kind of in a position where he needed to make it look like they weren't one and the same thing, which it was becoming difficult to tell. So what he does is he says, hey, John Foster Dulles, I would like you to bring an antitrust suit against United Fruit Company so, you know, we can get a little distance. And that's exactly what he does. And Dulles didn't want to do it, but he kind of had to. It was basically an order from the president. And, you know, there's irony here because when you go back to our discussion in episode two about the merger, this is exactly what Sam was afraid of. This was United Fruit and KML, who was one of its biggest competitors, joining together. This was a blatant violation of antitrust law. And he knew it, but the government said, hey, it's fine. Like, we won't ever bring this up again. But basically, <laughs> Eisenhower just like, forget that. I know what I said, or I know what the United States said to you, but that's not the case anymore. And so long story short, United Fruit was forced to sell a third of its holdings in Guatemala to a competitor. And it elected to sell to Guatemalan competitors as opposed to Standard Fruit, which at that time was its biggest competitor and later became Dole. And, you know, this was a big deal. This absolutely crushed their profits. By the 1950s, it was five times as expensive to grow a banana. And this was largely because of the continued land clearing and increased usage of fertilizers. And as we mentioned all the way back in episode one, more fertilizers made these plants grow faster and taller, which made them more susceptible to hurricanes because they were easier to pull out of the ground, basically. But like I said, it really crushed their profits. In 1950, profits had been $66 million. By 1955, they were down to $33.5 million. And in 1960, they were down to a poultry $2 million. And to put this in perspective, before Sam took over as United Fruit Company president in the bottom of the economic depression, he was worth $3 million. And so in 1960, United Fruit only made $2 million as its profit. So in a way, the fact that Sam had retired earlier prior to 1960 was yet again a stroke of luck or perhaps a stroke of genius. Yeah. Another issue that they ran into that really affected their profits was that they did not jump on the Cavendish bandwagon nearly as quickly as some of their competitors, specifically Standard Fruit, who, again, will later go on to become Dole, still in existence today. We talked about the fact that the Big Mike was under attack by Panama disease, and it was extinct, basically. People had switched, and, you know, there was just a lot of bad luck on the part of United Fruit. They had researched different strands of bananas that just didn't end up working out, whereas Standard Fruit jumped right on the Cavendish, and you know, that is the banana that you eat today. The United Fruit Company, yet again, not having learned its lesson from 1954 Guatemala, made another blunder, and that's in 1962 during the Bays of Pigs, which I just mentioned, actually sent two ships to support the overthrow of Castro. And that's really a, a little bit of an odd story, because Castro himself had had good relations with the United Fruit Company because his father, who was relatively privileged, had been leasing land from the United Fruit Company prior to the Cuban Revolution, of course. But Castro realized very early on, as he tried to push the United States out of Cuba himself, that the United Fruit Company was overall a negative impact on Cuban sugar workers, because the United Fruit Company, of course, also had sugar, not just bananas. And he also had the memory of 1954 Guatemala, of course, because of Che Guevara. And so it's a weird break. Actually, what is interesting to note here is that United Fruit Company had been on good terms with Castro himself, with Fidel Castro himself. So not just his dad, but also with Fidel. Fidel and his brother Raul, Raul is still currently president of Cuba, actually had been seen at cocktail parties that United Fruit Company was hosting. But the entire memory of Guatemala and also 
the, the fact that, again, the United Food Company wasn't treating workers very well, led Castro to nationalize the United Food Company in 1959. And that explains why in 1962, the United Food Company sent two of his ships with Cuban anxieties that hated Castro to overthrow Castro. And so, in a certain way, the United Food Company did not learn its lesson from Guatemala. Yeah, and so really United Fruit Company finds itself in a difficult spot, not just politically, but financially, like we just addressed with its uh, stocks plummeting. And so there are some efforts to actually be more accommodating to Latin America after the failed attempt to overthrow Castro had been yet another debacle. By the way, in 1961, I said 1962 earlier. So in one of those ways in which you see that the United Fruit Company was more accommodating was, for instance, when we had another social democrat, Pepe Figueres, who came to power in Costa Rica and was in power several times, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, I think, and some, at least three times, when he was challenging the United Food Company on its many, many profits and said, no, you are leaving 60% of your profits in this country, the United Food Company actually acquiesced to that demand for the first time ever. So very different approach than it had been on the Arbans. Arbans, the leftist, had seen much and much resistance by the United Food Company, of course, as we addressed at length, but under Figueres, it no longer was in the same kind of power position and was afraid that its reputation would be further tainted. So I want to circle back real quick to Sam before we continue to talk about United Fruit Company, which we will because, as we are about to learn, United Fruit Company, well, obviously, outlives Sam. Sam retired from United Fruit Company entirely in 1951. He went back home to New Orleans. He sold all of his shares in the company. He just wanted a totally clean break. His Parkinson's was getting a lot worse. But in the time that, you know, he still con- had control over his faculties, Cohen really describes his later years as him enjoying walking around New Orleans for as long as he could, you know, hanging out in coffee shops, that sort of thing, just kind of being a figure in, in New Orleans. Continued some philanthropic efforts, specifically, uh, he worked a lot with Tulane. I've never been to Tulane, but I guess there are still quite a few buildings that are named after him and that sort of thing. He died on November 30th, 1961 at the age of 84. He was worth $30 million at the time of his death. And again, much of that was given away specifically to Tulane. As I mentioned, I believe in uh, episode one, he gave away the mansion that he lived in in New Orleans to Tulane, and it is currently the house of the uh, university president. Now, as I said, United Fruit Company lived on. And lives on. So, Marcus, do you want to take us through the end? Yeah, so the United Fruit Company, yet again, under a new CEO who basically bought up all of United Fruit Company and then uh, just rebranded it as United Brands, uh, tried to save itself, but it really didn't last that long. As a matter of fact, Eli Black, who was the new investor who had taken over the United Fruit Company and turned it into United Brands, uh, ended up killing himself. He took his favorite books from his library, of which he was really proud about his library put it in his suitcase, threw his suitcase from a skyscraper and jumped down. And whether it's apocryphal or not, one policeman allegedly, and that's of course why it could be apocryphal, allegedly remarked that it was very selfish to kill yourself jumping out of a skyscraper because you could actually hit other people and kill them while you're you're taking your own life. He's not wrong. He's not wrong. Thankfully, as tragic as it is, but Black did not kill anyone else. And so why why did he kill himself? Really because all efforts to rebrand United Brands did not work. There were also more corruption scandals. So even though, yes, Black had a different uh, outlook on the company and actually wanted to salvage his reputation, there were more scandals. And what happened in the end to United Food was that uh, it became Chiquita. Later on, it moved to Cincinnati, became Chiquita. Chiquita already had been like a marketing brand of United Fruit, but it really then assumed that name. And also Del Monte, which is a very large banana company as well, of course, for anyone who has ever been in a supermarket knows, also purchased more parts of United Fruit, especially in Guatemala. Bananas themselves continue to be monocultural plants that are susceptible to disease. Yes, we have to Cavendish, but it's actually still a threat, to the point that a book that I read in from the early 2000s actually claimed that we might not have bananas much longer, which thankfully has not proven true. But... Uh, it definitely continues to be a struggle to deal with that disease, even though Cavendish did so much better than the Big Mike. Also, corruption scandals, how could it be different, have not ended. So one another interesting example was that when there was a banana war of a different kind between the European community, the predecessor of the European Union, and the United States, and our companies in the United States, over tariffs, what the De Monte president did was donate $500,000 to the Bill Clinton re-election campaign in 1996 to get the Clinton administration to sue the European community and the World Trade Organizations 
for its tariffs on bananas that were put by the European community in place from bananas that stemmed from Central and South America. Because it's interesting to note that while we have the United Food Company in the United States and, of course, uh, its successors, there are similar, very powerful banana interests, especially in Great Britain and Europe. And those banana interests con control most of the banana plantations in Africa, in the Pacific, and also much in the Caribbean. The Caribbean, of course, having been British for a very long time. So here again, some uh, conflicts of interest, perhaps, between companies and politicians. Uh, someone would put it more euphemistically and say, well, that's just what lobbying is. Uh, money is speech. But that's for a different story altogether. Yet one more interesting sca scandal and that I would invite uh, every listener to perhaps watch at some point is the documentary Bananas, which documents how a Swedish filmmaker was sued by the Dole Company, so Dole again being the successor here of Standard Fruit rather than United Fruit, but uh, he was sued by the Dole Company for claiming that Dole banana workers were suffering from cancer due to pesticide exposure. Hopefully, though, we will not get sued for pointing this out. Well, if we do, if any of you are listening at Dole and you'd like someone to sue, I assure you that the only person who you need sue is Melvin Barnes. He's not here to defend himself, so yes. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's really crazy to, to think about, you know, all the stuff that you said, like how much controversy, how like the global implications of this little fruit. It is. And it's, uh, there is this great phrase of the high cost of low cost. And we pay very, very little for bananas. It's still very profitable. There's enormous power behind our consumption. And of course, especially the fourth largest staple in the world that is being consumed. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess in conclusion, you know, we hope that you have enjoyed learning about Sam Zamuri, but also learning about the forces that, you know, were involved in shaping the isthmus and in Latin America and in U.S. foreign policy and basically just like the global impacts of that Zamuri and, and people like him had during this period in time. Again, he's not a super well-known figure, but I personally would recommend that you pick up The Fish That Ate the Whale by Rich Cohen if you are interested in um, finding out more about Zamuri in particular. And Marcus, I'm sure, has some recommendations about this topic or um, other books about the, the region in general. Yeah, uh, also for further reading, what I would recommend is, for instance, Peter Chapman's Bananas, How the United Fruit Company Shaped the World. He has a fascinating uh, chapter by James Hancock in Plantation Crops, Plunder, and power, evolution, and exploitation. The chapter is on bananas specifically. And then this is really off my memory, so do not quote me, but Stephen Kinzer's and Stephen Schlesinger's Bitter Fruit, which is very much about a night fruit company, probably the most important study on the topic that came out in 1981. The second edition came out in 2005. And last but not least, Piero Clahase's Shattered Hope, which very much pushes back, against, actually, against the narrative that the United Fruit Company had a lot of influence over U.S. politicians and really zones in much, much more on the fears that U.S. policymakers had, how very much afraid they were of Arvin's drive to the left. Well, with that, uh, Marcus, unless you have any further parting words, I just want to say thank you from both Melvin and myself for coming on and helping us to spread the word, spread the history of Sam Murray and, and of Latin America and... Um, to the listener, I, we, we really hope that you've enjoyed uh, listening to this and getting a chance to kind of broaden your knowledge and the scope of your knowledge on, on the region if you didn't have it. If you enjoyed this, please, you know, let us know. Tweet at us, email us, all that stuff. Let us know if you enjoyed it. Let us know if you didn't enjoy it so we can banish Marcus forever from the Life of X state-of-the-art recording studio. I'm just kidding. He's coming back whether you like it or not. But yeah, let us know what you think. Other than that, thank you for tuning in, and we will be back. Goodbye. Goodbye.